Hi. Well, this is South Wairapa Rotary Club's um, turn this month to talk about uh, Rotary, well, Rotary Matters, stuff that Rotary's been on about for the last uh, little while, uh, specifically from a South Wairapa perspective. Uh, I'm here with Tamara. Uh, Tamara, we better say something, otherwise the camera won't turn your way. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I, um, yes, I'm here to, with Paul Mason to talk about what's been going on with Rotary in the South Wairarapa. Great. Now we've pulled the camera now because they're both on you. <laughs> That's a bit of a uh, but anyway, so here we are. We'll talk about uh, South Wairarapa um, events and things that have happened around us uh, in the last little while. Probably the first one that I would like to talk about is uh, Steve Davis, one of our uh, long-serving members. Um, Steve died recently. Um, he's been a member uh, since 1985 and uh, in that time has just made a real mark on the club. Uh, I've only been there a short while, uh, maybe 10 years, and um, in that time Steve was just a, 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 a real uh, a fount of wisdom and a person who was always there when you needed him. Um, he was, in the latter years, uh, our speaker-seeker which in rotary parlance means that he's the man that goes and finds people that will come to our meetings and talk to us all about the whatever. Uh, and his, his general uh, methodology was to look in the newspaper and find somebody that, that he thought he'd like to listen to, and he'd ring them and see if they would come. He said oh, they could only say no, so he rang the most interesting people and uh, had them come and talk to us. We've had uh, ministers uh, of the Crown, we've had people from, um, uh, we had a, a Muslim cleric at one stage, uh, just a, a fascinating array of people. Uh, so we're going to really miss Steve, and uh, but it's been great having him around. Um, so one of the, oh, we, I should just mention that uh, we had Steve's funeral uh, on the 6th of May, and um, on the meeting after that, Peter Franks, had some comments to make, and he said that Steve had been a youth convener in 2003, uh, um, uh, which means that uh, he was looking after the youth committee within our club. Uh, and uh, in that time, he had this brilliant idea of giving every child in school a book. When they started school, they would get a book um, to kick them off, and that's still going today. So every year since then... Um, Back in 2003, we have given a book to every new school entrant in the South Wairarapa. Um, so we, we're certainly going to meet him. Another of our old folks, <laughs> old folks, our... Um, Very long-standing uh, long, members. Yeah, long-standing members, thank you. That's what we're talking about, is France Skeet. France Skeet just turned 95. Uh, so he was a charter member. He's, in fact, the last of our charter members. Um, so um, he's been, I figured, he joined in 1969, and so he's been in the South Wales Rotary Club for 52 years. He very rarely misses a meeting, and so that means he's been to something like 2,500 meetings in that time, if my maths correct, every week for 52 years, 50 allowing for about 48 meetings, uh, months, uh, meetings in a year. Anyway, so I'm hoping that math works out. Uh, so we had a party for him, oh, well, a birthday cake, huge birthday cake. Um, Alan Percy uh, likes chocolate cake, so he decided it was going to be just your basic chocolate. Uh, but uh, 10 o'clock bakery did us proud with this great big, really delicious, moist yeah, love chocolate cake <laughs> uh, with a great ganache uh, filling in it. was really nice. Uh, so we cut that all up and everybody had a piece. Um, fantastic. Thank you, France. <laughs> uh, um, and now our second oldest member in the club is Noel Smallwood, who um, he's been a bit crook of late. 
Uh, Tamara, you could probably tell us a bit about just Noel, because you've had quite a bit to do with him, haven't you? I have. I go and visit Noel most weeks as he's in um, Palliser House and no longer able to attend meetings, but he really likes hearing about Rotary News and uh, talking about some of the older days and what things were like when he was president. Um, he also enjoyed a piece of France's magnificent chocolate cake. Thank you. Okay, so now, um, this is it this month or this year? <laughs> I haven't written down. Youth in Focus. Youth in Focus. Um, uh, so Rotary, I think, is uh, um, uh, focusing on youth a bit now. And uh, f so we're, the things we're doing are sort of centred a little bit around youth. Um, a week before last, we had uh, Carol McNaught come and talk to us at our meeting and tell us all about the Carterton Toy Library uh, that she's... Uh, uh, Gr sorry, Greytown Toy Library. Thank you, Tamara. <laughs> the Greytown Toy Library. Of course, we wouldn't have the Carterton Toy Library. I don't think they've got one, have they? I'm not sure. No. Anyway, so, uh, which had fallen to disrepair, sadly. But um, anyway, Carol's taken it over, and uh, the new broom definitely sweeps clean. So she has got rid of all the cobwebs and the uh, bits of equipment that needed to be repaired. She said a lot of them were in a very sad state. Um, so uh, she's renewed and refurbished, and uh, uh, so probably a time to, well, if you've got kids, get into the Greytown Toy Library and see what they've got. Makes complete sense. The uh, I should put a plug in there for the Featherston Toy Library, of course, uh, which is one that I've had more to do with, um, which uh, they buy toys and uh, they have a great selection of toys, and so it makes a great deal of sense to go and borrow the toys instead of having to go and shell out yourself. You know, well, you know how much they cost. It's crazy. Um, having had a couple of kids myself and now, of course, grandchildren, and they all want the toys. Um, uh, I, I do say, have said quite frequently, if I'd known how, how good it was having grandchildren, I think I would have started with them first. But um, anyway, we, we've stuck with what we've got. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, uh, anyway, toys. So... I don't know that they'd hire out things like Lego um, blocks and stuff like that, probably. They're a bit technical. My Both my grandsons are, are big techo builders, as you can imagine, They're building uh, skyscrapers out of Lego, and, but they've all got to have you know rocket-powered, or well, one of them is more um, uh, trucks and cars, so he'll build anything that looks like a truck out of Lego. Anyway, enough of that. That's Toys and Toy Library. We also had the jazz band, the Kikarangi uh, jazz band. Do you know what Kikarangi means? It I, means blue sky. Blue sky, really? Okay. Um, Kikarangi. And they're from uh, Kurunui College, aren't they? Yep, so they're the Kurunui College band. Um, and uh, they're jazz. Uh, jazz, of course, is music for musicians. So not all of our members thoroughly enjoy uh, uh, bought into the whole, they all enjoyed the evening of course, but um, music for musicians and the uh, one of the leader of the band had to remind us at one stage that um, when people hit a bad note or the wrong note, it wasn't actually the wrong note, it was an adventure. <laughs> and the idea with jazz is to try things out and sometimes they don't quite work and so the skill of the jazz player is to use that note that doesn't quite work and meld that into a new run that does work. And I thought they did a great job. They're were, they were very good. You know, I mean, they're all quite young. I mean, what are they? Eighteen something? something Seventeen? Like that. Is that is that the end of college? They're, they're, Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, getting there in the end. So they're sort of seventeen, eighteen year old, are doing so well on their um, uh, um, on the various instruments. We had um, uh, the bass guitarist, a girl on bass. And then we had two saxophones. Three. Three saxophones. That's right, because one of them also played the guitar. So, uh, and he did a, a very creditable guitar solo. And we had a drummer as and, well. And a drummer. Oh, I forgot about the drummer. He was right in the back, wasn't he? He was. I don't even think I've got him on, on the film. I took a few photographs, and I don't remember the drummer. But there you are, the drummer. There. The pianist wasn't there. Um, no. I think that was a bit too difficult to organise. Okay. But the, the line-up I, it was very good. I don't normally care for jazz myself, I like classical music, but these guys I heard at the Martinborough Fair playing in the square 
where I was on duty and it was a real pleasure. So I was delighted to hear them again. I think they play quite mellow sort of jazz, not too edgy. Okay. All right. Um, so they, uh, oh, I've got, uh, oh, I did. Francis Murray was on the drums. Oh, the drums, Amethyst Sutherland on the bass. So that was the young lady on the bass, Amethyst Sutherland. And she's related to our Brian Tucker. Right. So you did you write this extra stuff in here with the names and everything? That's pretty clever. Um, so we had the band leader was Alex Hartley. See, when I wrote the notes, I didn't know the names, but Tamara, in her usual efficient mode, has given me the names as well. So there we go. The leader of the band, who also played the uh, the lead guitar, a very creditable uh, few licks on the um, lead guitar. So he was the alto sax. Then we had Rowan Higgins on the tenor sax. Adam Butler on alto sax. He wouldn't happen to be any relation to the inimitable um, uh, okay. Carterton Butler. Mm, I, don't Ella, know. Ella, no? I don't know. Okay, all right. Uh, Sasha uh, Francis Murray was on drums, the one that I hadn't mentioned, and as I said, Amethyst Sutherland on bass, and pianist Amon Terry wasn't there, right? Right. So improvisation, as um, Alex reminded us, plays a huge part in their repertoire and in, in jazz indeed. So he encouraged the members uh, to applaud at the end of a break, recognising that uh, they start off the song with uh, pretty much going over the um, the main melody and then after that improvising over the top of it, uh, making it up on on the spur of the moment. And um, it, it's a, a real challenge. Um, so um, Tamara tells us here that they segue effortlessly between solos. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> they really were most impressive, those yes. young guys and oh, good. girls. Now, if my phone goes in the middle, I've just realised I've left it turned on, but I'm gonna, not going to... I'll just kill it if it rings. Um, OK. So, oh, they've been to a competition, did you say? They did. It was um, in Tauranga, a national jazz competition, and they said they learned a terrific amount from the experience. There was a Wellington jazz band, I can't remember what school, that walked off with most of the prizes. So they must have been exceptional because our guys were so good. Absolutely, yeah. So they didn't get quite get the first prize. I just noted a little at the end here that they found the competition was a great learning experience. That yep. was what Alex said. Yes, yes. okay. All right. Um, so anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed them. I, um, I didn't... Yeah, I was introduced to jazz by uh, Mary, my wife, who um, worked uh, in the uh, Conservatory of Music um, in Wellington and met a lot of the um, up-and-coming uh, jazz players or musicians of every uh, colour. And uh, so I was introduced to jazz back then and uh, um, this whole concept of improvisation and it really sort of struck me but um, uh, all the skills of some of those musicians were just outstanding uh, um, I remember going to one of the hotels and seeing one of the groups uh, playing and um, I'd never really understood drummers you know they just sort of sit in the background there and bash and uh, always have pictures of the animal you know <laughs> in the Muppets <laughs> uh, but watching the drummer in this particular jazz band uh, as he was playing along on the song, and then he started playing uh, on the edge of the table next to him, and uh, I, and it was just the right sound, you know, for that particular part of the music. He needed that woody sound, and then later on he played uh, on the stem of his one of his, you know, um, like his hi hat or something, and then another time he was playing, there was a pole, a big uh, pylon next to him in the in the hotel, and he was rapping away on that but um, just the inventiveness was just absolutely uh, I thought oh oh drummers do stuff isn't that incredible anyway I'm raving on Tamara's going to tell us a little bit about Genevieve uh, Nightingale aren't you I am so um, we get involved with a wide range of young people one way and another and Rotary also runs an international youth exchange program so um young people can spend up to a year in another country hosted by the Rotary Club in that country. So last year um, we had a, a student from 
great town, Genevieve Nightingale. So she was younger than most. She was only 14 when she went to the selection program, but fortunately turned 15 at that weekend, and she did get selected to go. And she went to Japan. She'd been studying Japanese here and before she went she came to our club and gave us a very accomplished presentation including a short speech in Japanese which of course none of us could understand but um, she had an excellent um, video display as well so in January last year off she went to Japan and the next thing that happened was that Covid hit and most exchange students had to go home. But Genevieve was determined to stay, and her host father um, it was, was very effective in helping her, and she got permission to stay for the whole year. So she actually experienced lockdown in Japan. As well as that, of course, it's a very different culture and a different language, and she found that although she'd studied it here, she couldn't really speak it all that well, although she could make herself understood. Um, at the school, she did a science and maths course, uh, not an easy option, and in Japan they take uh, education very seriously, so on Saturday morning they have what's called cram school. This is an addition to quite a long school day. Then when they went into lockdown, she got tuition in Japanese, and that made a huge difference, and her Japanese improved enormously. As well as that, she joined a karate club and um, gained additional belts and made a lot of great friends. And she also took singing lessons from a retired opera singer who was a relative of one of her families. She also gave presentations to the host Rotary Club every month. And finally, towards the end of the stay, they came out of lockdown, so she was able to visit various places in Japan. Um, she told us one, one of the biggest things about her stay was the friends she made, both Japanese friends and also students from other parts of the world. So it was a, um, she said, a terrific learning experience. She grew up a lot um, and she's planning to go back there after her gap year, which will be in mm. a couple of years' time. And now she's back in New Zealand. She's very busy with a wide range of school activities, including drama. Um, Fantastic. OK, well, the other end of things, of course, is we have a youth and um, older persons committee so it used to be just the youth committee and um, and that uh, well obviously handled youth uh, but um, it's becoming more of a focus now with us baby boomers taking over the place um, and so um, uh, the president last year Brian decided that he would pull together uh, the uh, or, or add a, a, another um, facet to the youth committee and call them the youth and old people's committee initially gay older persons older, <laughs> well I'm one of them so I can say it I suppose but now, youth and older persons yes so um, you've got to uh, um, uh, anyway so enough youth and older persons activities so um, some of the things that they've been up to of late um, we were approached by Kurunui College to get some C pens to assist students with dyslexia. Very clever little device that you uh, just drag over the text. Some of you uh, uh, older people might remember the handheld scanners back when um, scanning things had just begun. And I remember buying one of the new scanners, and it was a handheld scanner, and you would drag it down the page in two columns, and then in the software you'd have to match it up uh, so you could get it to uh, um, show the whole page. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this, you take it along a line of text, and it reads it out uh, for the, uh, for the obviously, person operating it. Uh, so uh, we bought a few uh, of those C pens uh, for Kurunui College, uh, peer support. Uh, Rotary is a supporter of the peer support programs throughout New Zealand. Uh, um, and uh, if you don't know, this program links senior students with year nine uh, students uh, and activities. 
uh, helps with the transition to high school. Um, there's also uh, RIDA, R-Y-D-A, of course we just call it RIDA, people love the acronyms don't they, but that's Rotary Youth Driver Awareness Program, uh, which is a, a fabulous program. Uh, we provide um, uh, a number of volunteers, last year we provided eight volunteers to go along to Solway Park where they were running the RIDA program. And uh, this is, um, uh, what is it, the Waka Kotahi um, Ministry of Roads or something or other, Transport, transport isn't it? Transport, Land transport. Is. Waka Kotahi. So they've, uh, they've pretty much got ownership of the program. Um, and the ch children there learn uh, the dangers of driving, or the dangers of uh, not driving well, I should say, the dangers associated with driving. Um, and uh, tries to imbue them with a sense of responsibility. The mantra generally is that uh, uh, that it's your responsibility. If it, it's up to me, you know, whatever happens is up to me. So it's their responsibility. They can't say that someone else shamed them into driving fast or whatever. And tries to get the uh, students to take ownership of their decisions. Shows them that they have the power to make decisions. They are the person in charge when they're driving the car. And they are allowed to make sure that people wear seat belts. They are allowed to tell people to be quiet and so on. Uh, one of the interesting graphs that they're shown earlier in the piece <coughs> is one that uh, shows uh, that when uh, students, or anybody I guess, are on their um, uh, learner permit, the accident rates are almost negligible on the axis. Uh, but the day that the restricted license is issued, the graph of deaths on the per, you know, driver, whatever, um, shoots up to, I mean, the top of the scale uh, that's on the page. Huge difference, and that's just like the day they that people get there restricted. And, I mean, I remember when I got my license, it was like, oh, I've got wings on my feet, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, nothing could stop me. And so I, I, you know, I certainly understand the feeling of this freedom that you jump in the car and off you go. Uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, back in those days, uh, my car was a, a Baby 8, a, a Ford 8, Baby 8, 8 horsepower, not 8 cylinder. So it had, among other safety features, a top speed of about 30 miles per hour. Rod brakes, uh, you know, wooden floor. So I couldn't get into a lot of trouble, apart from the car falling down apart around me. Uh, but these days, of course, the cars are, are built for speed. You know, they sort of, you, you, you can't, almost can't buy a car that can't do 140, 150 kilometres an hour. So, uh, and, and very efficiently, very quickly. So they just put their foot on the accelerator. We put your foot on the accelerator and next thing you know, you're travelling at 100 and whatever. Oh, of course, with me, it's 100 kilometres an hour, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway. Could um, I say something about the demonstration of stopping distance that they oh, had, yes. which is, of course, closely related. So... Um, they had a um, one of the staff drove the car um, first of all at like 50k and got to a certain point, applied the brakes, and then they marked how far it went before it stopped. And then they did that at 80k and 100k, and that really showed what a difference it makes um, to your stopping distance. Yeah, it's a bit shocking. And so they challenge the students uh, to um, guess where the car is going to stop, uh, and they are often a little bit surprised at, at um, how far it takes a car to stop. And so, what do they say? Only a fool breaks the two-second rule. I seem to remember from years ago. That stuck with me. Um, so there's Ryder, Rotary Youth Dr Driver Awareness at the uh, showgrounds, uh, Year 12 and 13 students. Um, we also supply the ingredients for the food, of course, to feed the hungry mouths, including us. Um, then there's the Kikarangi uh, Kurunui Jazz Ensemble, um, which uh, we helped travel to their um, jazz festival in Tauranga. 
And then, uh, of course, I've mentioned before the bursaries, the Martin Refair bursaries, at uh, uh, $4,000 each for uh, 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 students to go and follow their studies, tertiary studies. Um, fascinating uh, interviewing the, child, the uh, students. He wanted to call them children. I suppose they are, aren't they? You know? But when I was their age, I didn't think so. Um, uh, but the skill, the the, the elocution, the, um, the the learning, you know, the, the things that they get to learn these days that uh, we never even thought about, uh, just absolutely amazing, uh, and um, very accomplished people. So uh, it was I was on the um, selection committee recently. On, on the last uh, round, along with um, Rob Smith, who of course has been uh, on the selection committee sort of approximately forever. Um, uh, fascinating talking to the students, absolutely fascinating. They, they know what they're doing, where they're going, what they're um, intended to do with their, um, uh, uh, with their learning. Very good. Um, also this year we have some individuals going to RIPEN, uh, another acronym for the Rotary Youth Program of Enrichment, which is held in Stratford. Uh, we've got two um, students going this year, uh, Te Arohe Aporo and Anihaka Marino went to the Leadership Weekend. And then we've got Innovative Young Minds. Coming up, that's a week-long residential program for young women specifically uh, in STEM subjects. Now, I had to look that up. STEM subjects, and that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, that's held in the July holidays, and it's held over in Wellington. So those two young women, I think they're both from Kurunui. Do you know? Not offhand. Okay, perhaps not. Uh, then we have uh, Pearl Baker. Uh, an apprentice builder uh, has gone to the Roth Rotary Youth Leadership Awards, which we call Ryla. Mm -hmm. You can imagine when we're talking about all these things, we say, oh, there's Ryla and Ryder and Rypen. And some people even know what they mean. Um, and Tamara has already mentioned Genevieve Nightingale, exchange student uh, to Japan. What an adventure, eh? Amazing. What an adventure. Fancy being stuck over there with all that you know, with the COVID thing. Man. Uh, and she just seemed to take it in her stride. In fact, she insisted on staying, didn't she? She, she did wanted to stay. She did insist on staying. Yes. Um, yes, she, she, well, it was an opportunity and she took it. Hmm. It would have been easy to just say, oh, well, I'll go home. But no, she, she took the opportunity. Good on her. That's fantastic. And great to hear from her when she came to talk to us about uh, her... Um, uh, her um, experiences was was lovely to hear her. She's a very lively and engaging young lady. One of our members said one of the things he likes about Rotary is we help young people. That's the first thing. And the second thing is then they come and talk to us about it afterwards. Yes, <clears throat> that's right. They're, they're sort of a bit of a free speaker. Mm. <clears throat> free in a number of ways. <clears throat> one is we tend to give people a bottle of wine when they come and uh, speak to us. But um, the young get people a, get chocolate. They, they, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Probably. Should we mention Grace, who spoke Grace. to us most recently? Oh, of course, yes. Have we not got her on the list? No, we haven't. My goodness. So we just had... Do you want to tell us about... Do you know about Grace? Do you think about Grace? A bit. A little bit. Okay. Um, I haven't got any... You just wrote up her, her the pricey, didn't you? So Tamara does our bulletin. So... So Grace Hancock's, um, we assisted to go on a spirit of adventure for their 10-day experience, and she came and told us all about it. Um, so there are 40 young people, and they're divided into watches of 10 each. And um, they start off as strangers, but very quickly they become really close friends, especially living and working at such close quarters. So they learn to sail the ship, and they also do the cooking and keep the ship tidy, which of course is a big safety thing. Um, they sailed from Auckland up to Great Barrier Island, where they had a couple of nights and a whole day on the island. 
um, which she found most impressive with the wildlife and the beautiful bush and an idea of what New Zealand might have been like in the old days. Right, when people had to live like that. Yes. Yes, indeed. And on the way, they saw dolphins playing around the ship. The dolphins apparently liked the feel of the wake of the ship. And there was a baby dolphin as well, which, you know, she really liked. And they saw whales spouting. And a completely different form of wildlife was the uh, Emirates crew who were practising for the America's Cup. And they did some fancy manoeuvres which brought them really close to the spirit of adventure. So that was quite exciting Mm. as well. I imagine, yep. And then day nine of their um, voyage was called Trainee Day. And they have the responsibility for sailing the ship on that day. So the crew um, do the cooking and the tidying, and the young people did the sailing. Mm. Uh, And she said it was um, an amazing experience. People um, learned to deal with leadership challenges, um, to overcome fears such as height, which I could relate to. I'm a bit phobic about heights, and they have to climb up the mast and do things. And and they came away with all these new friends. So Grace is now at... Victoria University doing a conjoint B-A-L-L-B. She was a very um, articulate and enjoyable speaker. Mm. No, it was good listening to her, all right? Um, It's easy to downplay that concept of uh, running the ship, you know, where they said, well, they they got to run the ship, and it just sort of comes off your tongue a little bit. Um, But as she spoke about it, she was quite – she was very proud of having – run the ship. She said, you know, that the uh, uh, the crew uh, gave the boat to them and said, this is yours, you've got to run it. And uh, at the end of it, you know, and they felt a bit, um, a bit concerned about that, uh, as you would do, uh, face that with trepidation. Um, and she was very proud of the fact that she'd done it. And I, I can really just relate to that. Um, I uh, spent a, a 10 years or so in the Naval Reserve and um, rose to the dizzying heights of lieutenant, of course. Uh, anyway, but I got to drive the uh, the fisheries protection boat and uh, do the navigation, all that sort of stuff, and so uh, did a lot of training. Now, years later, fast forward uh, another 25 years, and uh, uh, Mary and I decided that we'd take a 25-foot um, Warwick, 32-foot 30, Warwick, down t- uh, uh, out to um, wherever we were going. Up north, Bay of Islands, that's right. Anyway, it was all a great thing in concept. Oh, I've done this before, easy, yep. And uh, so I uh, reset my boat master's ticket and sort of got myself a bit up to speed on things and felt reasonably confident that I could, uh, you know, like a bike, get back on again. Uh, but as we drove out of the marina in this boat, I had this huge sense of responsibility that I was in charge of this boat. And it was it was almost paralysing, and so I could really relate uh, to Grace when she said how they felt when the crew said, "You've got the boat," and they they thought, "Gee, we don't break it." Uh, there's a real sense of this thing is floating on the water. You've got crew and you've got people in the boat that could drown if it falls over. Uh, huge responsibility. So well done. I think they did a great job. Um, just moving on, uh, also Rosa Hassel, we uh, have just helped her get to Outward Bound, and Grace uh, spoke of her experiences with Outward Bound as well. Um, she's in Wairapa College, but lives in, oh no, it's Grace that lives in Wairapa College. Work. Well, she was at Wairapa College. Yes. Yeah. Wycol, that's right. Yes. Uh, but lives in Greytown. Um, so Ashley Taylor uh, was the next one. Um, now, Ashley, we uh, helped her get off to the Globe Theatre in London for a three-week course. It's on hold at the moment, but um, hopefully, she'll you know this will uh, things will come right with, once we get a few vaccines happening. And you may not agree with vaccines, but that's that's your problem. <laughs> um, Ashley, however, um, it, it was selected to go to the. Uh, globe and uh, and we're going to support her when that all comes about. Um, Ashley does a lot with uh, uh, other forms of um, acting and um, she's uh, very strong in the local board games 
uh, club where they uh, do the Dungeons and Dragons and role playing games like that. So she, she's uh, very um, uh, active in that sort of style of things. Uh, primary schools. So um, I mentioned before how Steve Davis inaugurated the the book, a picture book for every new entrant in South Wairarapa, South Wairarapa schools, and um, they, that's been uh, running for many years, or since uh, 2003 or whatever it was that I just said <laughs> before, and have now forgotten. Uh, so we give money towards the schools running their uh, swimming sports in Masterton um, and um, uh, there's the Greyhound School for their radio groups program. In fact, I think they they do it with Arrow Radio, you say. Is yes. that right? Okay. Hey, go Arrow Radio. There's a plug for Arrow. Radio with some pictures, they say. Uh, and and there's Piranoa School Pool as well that we um, gave some money towards refurbishing it. Yep, refurbishing the pool. Fantastic. And then there's the general school programs. So, oh, and there's Project M. Project M, which I'd never heard of before. Project M. The Muffins. The Muffin Man. So it's a group that makes muffins for schools to freeze and they have on hand uh, if students don't have a lunch with them. So how does that work? Do they deliver them to any school like beforehand, or how do you know anything about it? I don't know much about it at oh, all. Okay, we'll have to look into that. Um, but anyway, it's one that somebody knows about because they're helping support it. Um, so we there we are. Talk about the um, Kura, um, Kahutara Schools wetland at this point, because uh, that's another school-related project. Okay. And of course, um, your wife Mary's been closely involved with that. She and has, she has. So uh, Mary works at Kahutara School, and uh, she works with the uh, um, numeracy and literacy program. Um, I, I need a bit of help myself <laughs> with that, by the sound <laughs> of it. Numeracy and literacy program, and she just loves it. The kids, and so on. And so, as part of that whole program, she has got very got the uh, children involved in a lot of. Um, other things uh, that they have to have to think about, they have to calculate, um, and that's things like gardening, and then the wetland. So they've started up the Mangatiti wetland. Is Mangatiti? Isn't Mangatiti, it? yes. Mangatiti uh, yes. wetland, um, uh, where um, Don, um, Fraser, Fraser Donald, I think. Fraser Donald. Yes, Fraser and his wife donated uh, uh, the corner of their. Uh, land closest to the school to turn into a wetland. It was already a bit of a wetland when they gave it, uh, but uh, they dug big holes in it, pools and ponds, and um, Fraser supplied a, um, uh, or the family supplied a uh, solar-powered pump, uh, because it doesn't have a river running through it particularly. It's not actually a wetland, it was just a damp land but too damp to be used. But mm. anyway, so to make it more wet, they're pumping in via, via use of a uh, solar pump into this wetland. And um, I did have pictures, I have to say, a, a lot of these things we're talking about, but I left them on a the thumb drive at home when I ran out the door to come to the studio. And so if, you could only have chatter today. We were going to have pictures of all these things. I've got kids at the wetland, show you exactly what's going on, looking for tadpoles, um, uh, planting all the different flaxes and sedges and you name it, what else they've got there. Um, native trees. Native, all sorts of native trees going in. Uh, they've had um, uh, people come and put in pathways and they've provided um, chairs, uh, you know, those sort of uh, bench seats for people to sit on from time to time. But a great program. And uh, so, and Mary's been uh, pivotal in uh, uh, to um, and give her a shout out there, as is the common phraseology, uh, uh, pivotal in getting this whole program working uh, and linking the Megatiti uh, wetland with people like Rotary to help with funding and with the tree people to supply trees, uh, with DOC to supply people who can help with advice. Um, 
just all the different aspects that you would imagine with quite a sizable piece of wetland. Um, uh, so she's done a, a really great job there with the kids and also the gardens. So she's established or, or refurbished all the gardens there. And last year they won the uh, coveted um, school. There's a huge shield with a great silver plaque in the middle of it. Just a, a massive, uh, a hugely impressive looking shield, which is the Garden Award uh, uh, for the, um, in the around the South Wairapa. Just amazing. Um, so, we've been through the uh, wetlands there. Ah, we should move on to the Martin Brefair and just give you a quick update. Um, shall I do that? Yes, you do right, that. I'll do that. So you are co-convener. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. That's true. I've, I've, so we won't go there. So um, Martin Brefair. We had a Martin Brefair, and I think um, you may not know, but we had to postpone the second fair. The April fair uh, was the March fair, postponed to April, uh, owing to, of course, our friend COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> so we had over 520 stalls, and it looks so far, I haven't quite added everything up, but it's looking like there's going to be around about $100,000 left over uh, for distribution around the various charities and charitable concerns um, around the south, mostly the South Wairapa, although our international committee uh, does dedicate some or use some of our funds um, for uh, work around the Pacific Basin. We pretty much stick to the Pacific. Um, we're certainly approached by other agencies who want um, uh, money spent in uh, everywhere in the world there's a problem um, but we pretty much stick to our little our local area so we haven't got a lot of money but a hundred thousand dollars isn't actually a lot in the scheme of things when you think of that guy I often think of that um, army the 90 year old chap who walked in his backyard and raised 16 million dollars um, I mean it was a it was a it was time and place thing but nonetheless it does tend to bring into perspective <laughs> if it's like ours when we think oh we are really clever we've got a hundred thousand dollars yes well it's not that much uh, but anyway we do put it to good use and um, as we've been saying before so there we are it was postponed to April wasn't quite as well attended I didn't think as the March fair um, the uh, storeholders did very well we had a few holes a few people were unable to come the last minute uh, there are a lot of people who therefore were able to come to the fair uh, and j just pay for a one-day store. Normally we insist that storeholders pay for two days. In our mind it's a two-day fair. just happens to be run over two days a month apart. Um, but uh, because we had postponed, of course, we had people who couldn't come due to COVID and we just refunded their money, of course, and then that meant that some stores were available for those who had been sitting in the wings. So I think there were a lot of people who uh, got to the fair for the first time. And um, the reports I had was that the, the stallholders did very well. And from the shoppers, of course, they had a good range of goods anyway. One problem we had, not enough coffee, I'm told. Not enough coffee, can you believe it? 40 minute waits at some of the stands. So we've been casting about to see what we can do about that. I just I hate to think that we'd end up with 32 coffee carts around the place just to service our nation's um, drug habit. Maybe just a couple of extra coffee carts would do the trick. <laughs> As a dedicated coffee drinker myself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I'm certainly guilty of the same, um, I have to say. Um, anyway, so we live on coffee. <clears throat> okay, um... Uh, now, we were going to slot in the bike ride there too, I think. Um, yes, our other major fundraising effort. I would like to say our club is really very fortunate in having the Martinborough Fair. And, you know, we don't have to do little weekend things which are very worthwhile and people work very hard at it. But it's, you know, coming out every weekend to do stuff is quite a different situation. Yeah. And when the fair was first postponed, um, I read that the members of the club were very much against the idea. <coughs> and it took quite a while to convince them that a fair um, like ours 
was a good thing to have. But eventually they did it. It was, of course, much smaller. I believe 35 stalls for the first one. Yes, and they would have made a loss except if it wasn't for the rotary stall selling um, homemade goods. Yes, and <laughs> pumpkins and apples and things. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. But um, as you say, it's it's gone on from strength to strength and, and it is what it is today. Not only the money, I mean, it, it, is, a, it, it is a good swadge of money, I have to say, having made those probably unwise comments earlier. Mm. Um, <laughs> But um, it's, uh, you know, we estimate, and we're going to do a count next year, uh, we estimate around 25,000 people come to each fair, and that's a lot of people to come into the Wairarapa, because many of them come over the hill or down from Palmerston North, stall holders that come down from um, uh, up north, up Tauranga and uh, Auckland, and others that come over the ditch, uh, not that ditch, the, um, uh, the strait. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, come up from Christchurch and places around there. So it's a, a huge influx of people as well as just uh, money in that way. Uh, I mean, years ago we had an accountant running the fair and so I think he probably did a lot of work for a lot of businesses around the South Wairapa and, and he, um, I guess, was able to look at what money was generally filtered in through a lot of the businesses and he estimated then which I think was probably about 12 10 or 12 years ago that at that time he estimated that the fair was bringing in around about eight million dollars into the uh, local economy in in various ways and means as you can imagine so eight million dollars ten years ago what is oh, who knows what that translates to but a lot a lot well, we now, recently had a talk from the chairman of the Martinborough Business Association about the impact of the fair on Martinborough, and I can't remember the numbers, but he said it has a huge beneficial impact because of all the um, people staying over, so that's accommodation, the hospitality, because they don't just eat and drink at the fair, a lot of them stay and eat and drink in town, and they buy wine. And uh, he said it's immensely beneficial. Mm. And also other organisations benefit as well, like the ones who supply parking. For example, Church and the Pony Club um, benefit. Mm. No, there's a wide range of, of, of people and organisations that benefit from the, um, from the fair. Now, we also have the Charity Fun bike ride coming up. That's coming up shortly um, <clears throat> on um, 31st of October. So uh, keep your eyes on the papers and various um, advertising media. Uh, there are going to be three rides. And again, I was going to have a map to show you exactly what it looked like so you'd know. Because um, I'm sure you're chomping at the bit to get on your bike. They do have an electric bike section for those of you who are more couch potatoes than bike potatoes. Um, uh, so there are three rides. There's a 48k ride, the 67 kilometer ride and 115 um, and it's all going to be the same routes as previous which I would have been able to point out to on, on my map <laughs> uh, anyway uh, the 48k K ride is a loop out along Longbush Road uh, Miller's Road out to Ponatahi and back to Martinborough the 67 kilometer ride uh, goes out along Longbush Road to Gladstone across to Carter's Line then to Ponatahi and back home again. The 115k road, they do the 67 kilometer loop first, and then they do the 48 kilometer loop. And so, oh, being a is that a suggestion? Yes, being a marshal. I've been. Have a you marshal. been a marshal? Yes, I have. I'm usually running around from pillar to post. Perhaps you can tell us about marshalling. Well. Um, I've been a marshal at the furthest or most distant point on the big loop, so this is where um, the really serious riders come first, and it's on Carter's Line, junction with Gladstone Road, and um, there are two of us, so the um, first time I did it, it was um, a bit unnerving to be expected to stand on Carter's line with a stop sign to stop the cars whizzing by as the big pelotons come past. 
but I've done it a few times now. It's got easier every time. And then when things are quiet, you get to, to get to know the person who's, who's the marshal with you. So I had some very interesting talks. And on another occasion, um, I was with a, another woman and we had a common interest in dance. So we practised a few moves while we were waiting. And we got some very funny looks from the traffic going past. <laughs> Not the cyclists, of course. We wouldn't want to distract them. No. And I must say, you know, that most of the cyclists would we'd point them in the right direction, make sure they didn't head off to Masterton, and and they'd wave or you know raise a hand and salute or call out, so that you know they were generally great guys mm. and gals. So um, it's it's quite enjoyable being a marshal. As long as it's not raining, of course. Of course, yes. Well, perhaps since you're chatting, chatting you might want to talk, tell us a bit about uh, conference. Well, uh, this year, uh, the district conference, so that covers the Lower North Island, that was held um, right here in the Wairarapa, most of it at the Carterton Event Centre, um, and we had the opening evening was at Cobblestones in Greytown, and that showcased some of our Wairarapa food and wine, and with local entertainment. Conference organised by District Governor Gillian Jones, who also lives in the Wairarapa. Uh, it was a very well run conference. I'd never been to one before, but I thought I'd better go this time. And we had nine people, which was quite a good attendance from our club. And um, there were presentations ranging from um, the what they call the governor train, which is like the current governor and the next one and the next one, to um, the polio, eradication of polio in India, which was a very inspirational talk. Um, we also had another inspirational um, speaker by video, Dr Paul Wood, who um, had been in prison as a teenager and turned his life right around. And that was one of the things that's really stuck with me. And the, the message that I take heart from is if an opportunity comes your way and it seems really, really scary, if you take it, you've got a chance to grow. And if you don't, well, it's passed you by on that occasion. And if you do the same as you've always done, you'll, you'll get the same as you've always got. Um, then there were talks from some of the young people who've been helped by Rotary, including our wonderful Genevieve. We had a... Um, Saturday evening was a dine and dance and that was very, very nice food, very entertaining. Uh, people got dressed up for the appropriate decades to when their club was chartered and ours was in 1969. So you had to go to the wardrobe and see what would look a bit like 1960s. <laughs> Hard to remember back that far. Um, it was very worthwhile and you were also at the conference of course you That's and right. Mary. I just I didn't have to worry too much about the costume I just got out some stuff out of my wardrobe and there I was in the 60s no that's not true that's not true but I did I did try not incredibly hard I must confess I'm not a great dresser upper um, <clears throat> but there were some people who went to great lengths on the night and it was a great credit to them and I, I, I generally think gee I wish I'd put more effort in but I, I don't know I, but slack when it comes Each to, to its own or her yeah. own. Yeah, that's right. And there were quite a few prizes for um, best dressed person and best dressed club and the club that had made the most effort. Some clubs had like a um, same out outfit for all the members, which looked most impressive. Yes, okay. Um, thank you. So that's that's the conference. We're all done on that, aren't we? So um, I might take the opportunity to give a bit of a plug for our Polio Plus. Uh, we speak about it well, hopefully every time. We've been working uh, now for some years <laughs> now um, <clears throat> to eradicate polio uh, from the face of the earth. Uh, and a few short years ago, uh, hundreds of thousands of children, mostly, but people, were uh, getting polio. It's a virus, and through inoculation, uh, polio is almost eradicated in the wild. Now, I suppose it's an interesting concept that polio was a real problem, and yet it was hundreds of thousands of people. You look at COVID now, another virus, and there are many who decry the 
you know, who say it's not actually, it's just a flu or, you know, put uh, put down the whole um, COVID concept. <clears throat> but um, um, it is a virus, and like, um, and like polio, it can be eradicated. Um, one thing to remember now, even while India now is gripped uh, in the uh, new polio epidemic, with COVID. COVID, with the new COVID epidemic, <laughs> um, there, um, I, I, I'm having difficulty. I've just had a bit of an argument the other day with someone about whether COVID was real or not, and it just, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I, at people who say it's just the flu, and and it, it and there's all this hype, and uh, it, it's a load of rubbish. Um, and then you look at these hospitals where emergency departments are overflowing. There is no oxygen. This doesn't happen for nothing. You can't make that stuff up. It's ridiculous. Where you see people backing up truckloads of coffins. Uh, this it's how people can think that this is a hoax. I, I'm it's beyond me. But um, anyway, enough of that. So yeah, India, in yeah. the grip of COVID-19, we, remi- we, remi- we are reminded that they're also celebrating being free from the polio virus for 10 years. And it's thanks to the um, ongoing support of uh, Rotary, it's Rotary's initiative, but supported by uh, people like the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, who give us $2 for every dollar, uh, that's Rotary, every dollar, Dollar Rotary managed to uh, scrape together. Uh, that foundation puts two dollars into the hat uh, and provides vaccines. And uh, and the proof, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The proof is that the uh, wild polio virus is all but eradicated. Hundreds of thousands of people suffered from it in years gone by, and now we can say it's almost eradicated. Where it's not eradicated, it's where people are f- are being misinformed, disinformed. And told that uh, the vaccinations are poison or, or whatever myriad of other uh, disinformation tactics are being used, and as a result, people are still getting polio and still being dreadfully crippled as a result of it. We were also lucky enough at conference to have a talk from Professor Baker um, from Otago, who was quite heavily involved in giving advice to our government about how to deal with COVID. Mm. Well, that was fascinating. I, it was great to listen to him. Um, now, speaking of meetings, we have changeover coming up. I think I might have mentioned that once before, but um, our uh, intrepid president, ex-president now, I guess, has moved to Christchurch. Um uh, as a necessity and so uh, we have an interim president which happens to be me in the hot seat for the moment um, and but we'll still be having the changeover uh, where I will get to hand the uh, chains of office symbolic of the um, years the, the hundreds of uh, presidents who have gone before who have uh, taken care of the club a year at a time some may say a year's not long enough, others say it's too long. <laughs> and uh, Tamara will be, oh, so next year it's Anne Atkinson is going to be our president. And the year after that is, uh, is, our, is this very Tamara, who you've been listening to today, who will be taking the reins, or the chains, the reins, and the chains uh, in two years' time. Now, we also have about one minute to talk about um, something uh, uh, you wanted to talk about the Wario I project. Did want to Would you talk like to have a quick chat about that? We've only got about a minute and a half left. Okay. Well, I won't waste any time. The Wario wetland is a very large wetland on the east side of Lake Wararapa, and there's been a project going on there for about 15 years. Uh, largely driven by an organisation called Ducks Unlimited and it's also been supported by Rotary. So it was really a wasteland rather than a wetland but they um, it had been badly affected by drainage pro- projects so it wasn't wet enough. So they constructed um, 
barriers to keep the water in, huge planting program, dis uh, destroying pest plants. And we, I was lucky enough to go on a guided tour and you could go from stage one, it's in four stages, stage one, which is, shows what it will be like, to stage four, under construction. It's a wonderful place to visit. Fantastic. Thanks, Tamara. Well, that's it from us. Um, lovely to have you along for the day. And I would look forward to seeing you another time in the future. Now, if I remember what Michael told me, he said, press the stop button. <laughs>